it's an honor to be here at the Google Cambridge uh, office. You know, this is a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. Uh, growing up as a nonverbal child, I was actually nonverbal till I was two and a half and diagnosed with something called pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified, a form of an autism spectrum disorder when I was four years old. And I want to take a minute today and really imagine Imagine just starting off with a potential employment opportunity and, and imagine not being able to get over 1,000 jobs. Imagine getting denied over 1,000 times for a meaningful employment. Now, that's one of the extreme cases, but that's actually one of the cases of a young man I know who's on the autism spectrum, who has an accounting major, who graduated college, was not able to get over a thousand jobs. And when I asked him about why he thought he wasn't getting those jobs, it was insane to hear about some of the things that were going on. Things such as, oh, some companies didn't necessarily think that disclosure was a good idea. Some companies didn't think that, you know, looking at the bottom line, that reasonable accommodations for me would be a little bit outrageous. And I'm happy to say he now has a job today at a Ford Motor Company. Uh, but it took a very, very long time for this man who grew up with many challenges due to autism. And uh, this is actually something I deal with almost every single day in our community. Today, as a uh, eight-year professional speaker, I travel the country talking about autism and inclusion and trying to become the best version of yourself. So my presentation topic today, the ROI benefits of hiring people with autism and other special needs in the workplace, some of the things that you truly, truly need to know about our community, and I'll, I'll share about this a little bit later, but. Uh, in terms of the autism community, over 80% of adults in the United States are currently unemployed or underemployed. And now I can say, based on overcoming many obstacles through uh, over five different therapies for almost 15 years of my life in occupational, physical, speech, music, and theater therapy, I have been able to overcome many of my obstacles today to pursue a career in professional speaking. It's given me the wonderful opportunity uh, to become an international speaker, uh, have the opportunity to write two best-selling books focused on special need parenting, the first book, Defining Autism from the Heart, focused on self-advocacy skills for some of my mentees uh, who were trying to come out about having an autism diagnosis for the first time. And a second book called Autism and Falling in Love focused on trying to help individuals with special needs try to find relationships and love for the first time. When I was 18, I had no idea how to talk to women. Pretty sure I still don't know how to talk to women for the most part. But I wrote this book based on 10 years of journal entries to help some of my mentees today. In addition to that, we've had the wonderful opportunity to consult on several major motion pictures to bring a realistic portrayal of disability to our entertainment industry. We have been blown away by the amount of films today that have been focused on on individuals with disabilities, but also TV shows. If anyone in here has seen shows such as The Good Doctor on ABC, which focuses on a surgeon who has autism, and Atypical, which focuses on an 18-year-old um, man on the autism spectrum trying to find love on Netflix. Uh, in addition to that, I hosted a TV show called The Different is Beautiful Show for over two years with the theme that normal is truly just a dryer setting. That was the main theme. We brought in many people impacted by a diagnosis to share their stories with the world to hear. And then finally, a nonprofit founder who's had the wonderful, I've had the wonderful opportunity to give out 52 scholarships for students with autism to go to college in uh, the past six years. So in addition to that, uh, in addition to those two books, we were actually also able to contribute to another book uh, called uh, College for Students with Disabilities, We Do Belong, which focuses on 17 stories of people with disabilities who successfully navigated uh, pursuing a post-secondary education. So some of the things you need to know about our community today is that uh, 
in terms of the disabled community, we are the fastest growing minority in the United States. One in five Americans currently today has a disability. And we've had the wonderful opportunity to work with countless individuals uh, doing coaching, mentoring, and training services for individuals with special needs as they transition to adulthood. And one of the big topics we talk about simply because of that is employment. Uh, this has given us the opportunity to work with the Department of Labor uh, many times on uh, initiatives such as the Employer Assistant and Research Network on Disability Inclusion. It's a mouthful, so we call it EARN, uh, which helps employers recruit, hire, retain, and advance people with disabilities. One of the big things you need to know about the unemployment rate, unfortunately, for those with disabilities today is that people with disabilities are, for, for the most part, majorly un unemployed. I mean, the autism community is one of the, the, the biggest signs, but in terms of the overall rate of individuals with disabilities is just about 8.4%, while people without disabilities is 3.7%. So when we go into businesses, we've had the wonderful opportunity to work with some amazing, amazing organizations. We, we talk about these main topics, but we talk about so much more as well. And one of the biggest things we talk about is that individuals with disabilities are more likely to stay at a job longer, reducing employee tur turnover. Uh, the, this has been a study that's been done uh, almost on an annual basis by the Department of Labor that's showing that people with disabilities are more committed to staying at a company longer. Uh, they're also because of the gratefulness of having meaningful employment, uh, having lower absentee rates. And in an environment today where we're, we're currently so focused on philanthropy in many of our businesses, 87% 80 of customers say they prefer shopping at stores and with companies that hire employees with disabilities. And a higher company standing once if an employee leaves because of the diversity that was offered, they're more likely to go onto any recruiter websites and encourage uh, people to uh, follow that company because of them hiring people with disabilities. And then finally, uh, in terms of reasonable accommodations today, one of the biggest things I get when I go into companies is how much will the bottom line cost me for hiring someone with a disability based on reasonable accommodations? And I'm glad to say today and it's something I spread so much awareness about year round is that uh, more than half of accommodations today are absolutely free, which does nothing to the bottom line. So it's a nice little perk there. Just to give you a little background on my own personal story growing up with autism, I grew up wanting to be the next Larry Bird, uh, and I have no vertical leap for the life of me, so that was kind of a, kind of a difficulty. However, uh, I really got involved with sport management. So one of my first internships ever was uh, CBS Sports, and I majored at Seton Hall University in sports management, and I was hoping to pursue a, a career in the sports world. Uh, once graduating from college, I had uh, offers to work with uh, many different sport-related organizations in uh, my tri-state area, and I really felt fell in love with my mentees. I, I came out for the first time about having an autism diagnosis because today I'm considered to have a quote unquote invisible disability. Many people I meet to this day are say, Carrie, you have autism, you don't look like you have autism. And I'm like, oh, that's an interesting way of putting it. Uh, and I have to tell them that I will always have autism for the rest of my life. But I felt, I truly fell in love with mentoring kids with disabilities as they transition to adulthood. So I pursued a career in public speaking and one of the biggest things we uh, one of the biggest reasons why we also decided to do this change was because we realized that many many individuals with disabilities were truly still not being able to be engaged with the world around them so I wanted to share with all of you really quickly a video where we're trying to make the, the world a more inclusive place for everyone to live can you say Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. I am a big, big friend of Santa. Me and Santa are BFS, we, we go way back. And Santa told me, Carrie, could you dress up as Santa Claus because you understand the needs of these kids and give them a holiday experience they would never forget? Smile, give me, yeah. Oh, big smile, big smile. Yeah, that was different, I think. So when everything is done, Growing up on the autism spectrum, I can never meet Santa Claus in a big mall with difficulties with bright lights, with loud noises, and not wanting to be around a lot of people. 
I started my nonprofit, KFM Making a Difference, in 2011. I wanted to be a role model for these kids by trying to help them with something that I never was able to get as a child. Can you dance with Santa? Yeah, there we go. We turn the music down. We turn the lights down in all the rooms for any kids who are affected by bright lights. And many of our elves are special education teachers and uh, therapists who truly understand the needs of these kids. We've been three years trying to do this, and every year, like, it's either like he's like crying and he doesn't want to do it. So this year he made it, like, actually, he made it. Yeah. You are an amazing mom. And it is so lucky to have you in his life. And he always will. I was actually nonverbal until I was two and a half years old, and I remember when the flash did go off, I would literally just start poking my mom and dad and not having the words to say it, feeling overwhelmed. Year after year now, we're seeing more and more of these events spraying out in local communities. Let's go see Santa Let's go see Santa. Merry Christmas. Ryan, right? I actually only just found out about this. For years, we just struggled. It's the mall and the noise and the line. A lot of times, kids that don't have visible challenges, it's very difficult. We want to make sure that these kids and these communities understand the need for more sensory friendly events, that this needs to be a national movement. So we travel the country now, and this was just one idea that I had when four years ago I was just thinking about how I can go about uh, trying to make more of a difference in our community and keep kids engaged in the world. But that Santa event, which we've had the wonderful opportunity to have f over 500 children with autism and special needs meet Santa Claus for the first time in a sensory friendly setting, we were thinking about our mentees a lot at this time too, and how we could go into businesses and talk about hosting sensory friendly events for maybe people who are adults with autism or other disabilities to make sure that they feel included in the workplace. We've talked to many uh, land developers about things such as the lights in some rooms and how some individuals with disabilities might have things such as sensory issues where bright lights might cause them uh, a, a little bit of issues to even talking about the size of walls to make environments a little less loud uh, for individuals with uh, special needs as well. So we, we, we started talking about that via a nonprofit organization we started in 2011 called KFM Making a Difference. At the same time, I was pursuing uh, my first uh, year as a professional speaker. So now we go around to countless businesses and talk about the need for more sensory uh, friendly actual environments for individuals with disabilities. In addition to that, we've had the wonderful opportunity to uh, give out a scholarship uh, for students with autism to pursue a post-secondary education where we now are able to say that we've given out over 52 scholarships for students with autism across the United States and internationally to uh, pursue a post-secondary so education. So. And in addition to that, the other big reason why we do what we do today is because we understand that autism and disability is a lifelong disorder. So each one of these individuals, uh, when I was growing up, I had no peer mentoring. And now I go into businesses and I talk to them about the importance of peer mentors for anyone, regardless if you're just starting the job or regardless if you're non-disabled, because each and every single one of us need to think about self-reflection at times and what's going to be our potential in the future. It's so very, very important. So I want to share a story with you. So over three years ago, we started a Facebook page called A Special Community, where we highlight people impacted by a diagnosis. We now have over 120,000 Facebook followers, all comprised of uh, amazing, amazing people from our community. And uh, every, every single place we go to speak now, we bring a tripod and a camera, and we highlight people impacted by a diagnosis to share with, with 
their stories with the world, but we also start out each interview with one question, and it's, what would you like for the world to know about you? And we met this amazing kid named Liam, he's 10 years old, from Minnesota, and he said he wanted people to know that sometimes, because of autism, it's sometimes difficult to make friends. And I wanted to share with you his story really quickly today. So we're going to be talking to the camera, and we want to make you famous. So we literally want to make you probably the most famous person on the planet. How's that sound? Okay, okay. Um, <laughs> no pressure. Autism basically makes it hard to connect. It makes it hard to get that connection, to make friends. They feel like more loners than, well, in groups. It's also a learning disability, and in some cases, it's hard. It's you have to. You can't speak. At, in some cases, I met a kid called Tom, who he he has autism, but he can't speak in proper English. He needs an iPad. So, Liam, one thing I want you to know is that. I was actually diagnosed with autism at an early age too. And I don't know if I've ever actually told you that, but I want you to know that I will always be here to be your friend if you need a friend, okay? Yeah. Because even though it, it, it may be hard at times to connect to other people, you know, I feel like so many people with autism like us just want like what anyone else wants, you know, to, to feel connected and to have a friend. So. Well, it's got a friend in me, okay? You want to pound this up? Yeah. You blow it up to me. Oh, he blows it up. <laughs> You're awesome, Liam. I'm kind of, kind of tearing up. Sorry. It's okay. It's kind of a worse. So we've had the wonderful opportunity to meet with hundreds and hundreds of kids around the world uh, to hear their stories, but then we took it a step forward. After every single video we've done, we've done a self-assessment to see how we can go about helping max maximize anything they mention in the video. So one of the biggest things with Liam was he wanted to make friends. So after the video went viral on Facebook, we started a Facebook group for him called Liam's Buddies, where moderated by his mom, we would have countless people just saying that they want to be Liam's friend. That gave Liam the courage to actually want to pursue trying to make more friends at his school. And now I can say that he has two really close friends at his school today. So we took this idea to start just doing more and more interviews. And this gave us an idea to focus on how we can do this to maximize employers understanding the world about people with disabilities and what they would like for companies to know. We've actually started a video series to highlight people with disabilities to uh, every single place we go, we try to share at least one or two videos for people to get the perspectives of individuals, not only with autism, but a wide range of disabilities. So the individual right here, his name is David, and David, uh, is actually one of the most amazing people I've ever met in my entire life. David is blind. He has a very rare uh, disease where he actually went blind at a very, very early age. And during his accommodations when he was growing up, he had to learn how to use a walking cane to get around. And he had to navigate reasonable accommodations once he transitioned to adulthood. And now, actually, today, we met him uh, speaking at a Work Matters Summit at PNC Bank in uh, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, where we try to talk about the ROI benefits of hiring people with disabilities. And this is what David wanted to share with the world. The greatest challenge was, was being afraid to admit that I was going blind. I was afraid to use a, you know, use a white cane to travel independently. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I didn't, you know, I, and then once you your fears and you learn the skills and strategies and techniques as well as positive philosophy, understanding and believing that it's respectable to have a disability and surrounding yourself with other people who are possibility thinkers and say, hey, you know, I can do what you can too. And uh, I think that's, that's one of the, the, the things that um, I had to really come to grips with. And then once I learned, once I 
Once I really believed that it was respectable to have a disability, once I learned to use assistive technology, once I learned to use a cane to travel independently, once I recognized and embraced those things, life got a whole lot better. Privileged uh, Carry to serve as the Executive Director of the Department of Labor and Industries Office of Vocational Rehabilitation. And we're the lead agency responsible for employment and training for people with disabilities in Pennsylvania. We work with over 70,000 people and helped over 8,500 people with disabilities find real jobs with real pay. So we're here today to partner with PNC and uh, other community advocates and partners to shine a positive light on the potential of individuals with disabilities and to help people recognize and understand and believe that people with disabilities are the most untapped talent pool for employers to consider. So that's why we're here, is to, to help spread the good word. I learned from a customer who said, <clears throat> don't confuse a bad day with a bad life. And I think like that's, everybody has bad days, you know. Everybody gets upset. Um, but I think that's really, like that's it. Like, you know, everybody, you know, you, got, you gotta, don't just go through it. You gotta grow through it. Sorry, so I, I think that's really important. Um, you know, don't confuse a bad day with a bad life. That's really, really important. There's gonna be good days, there's gonna be ups, there's gonna be downs. You know, some days you're the statue and some days you're the pigeon. And, you know, and so just knowing that there are people out there who, who want to see you succeed, succeed. Can I just say, like, really quickly on camera, I, I, I want to jump right back in. Yeah. You know, I think you're, what you're doing. Yep. We need more people such as you who just don't let anything get in their way. Because I know I won't get let anything get in my way, and I know. Mm -hmm. uh, but you'll do the same. I appreciate that, Karen. That's you know we we need more people who are just possibility thinkers who just you know do your best when you feel like at least track me you now. I I think we're good. <laughs> So if I leave you with anything today, I hope it's truly that you consider yourself, what David was saying, a possibility thinker. I think in our community today, one of the biggest things that I see is that companies look at what they can do to help individuals with disabilities, but I think we need to change that mindset where we're thinking about what individuals with disabilities can do for a company versus the other side around. This, I think, and thinking as a possibility thinker, like David said, can lead to amazing, amazing change. David now in his 50s has helped employ thousands and thousands of individuals with disabilities simply by growing up with a disability and knowing that it is one of the most untapped markets today in the United States. So the, via our Facebook page, we've had the opportunity to interview people with autism, cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, ADHD, but also people who have been impacted by disease such as David to share their stories with the world. It's given us the opportunity to have these videos seen over 30 million times. And we actually download the videos for organizations, both business organizations and also schools as educational videos and resources for them for individuals who simply just want to learn from the perspective of those impacted by a diagnosis. So one of the big initiatives that we do is during a month in October, which uh, has been proclaimed uh, from the Department of Labor as National Disability Employment Awareness Month. This is also National Disability Awareness Month, where we truly highlight this untapped potential. We highlight stories of people impacted by a diagnosis who are succeeding in the workforce today, but then we also highlight the people who are 
not necessarily having a good time trying to find employment like the boy I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation. So in addition to the videos we highlight, I also share my own personal perspective growing up with autism in very quick educational videos, which I share with employers throughout the month of October to encourage employment of those with disabilities. Every month in October, the United States Department of Labor hosts National Disability Employment Awareness Month, an annual awareness campaign that looks to celebrate and educate about disability employment. I'm asking you today to consider supporting the cause, hosting events in your workplace around the month, and if you haven't already, look to employ those with disabilities in your workplace. The idea behind NDEAM, as they like to call it, goes back to 1945 when Congress passed a law saying that the first week in October would be National Employee the Physically Handicapped Week. Today, almost one in five Americans has a disability in the United States, showing the incredible impact a month like this can have. I have a personal connection to the disability community and autism. I was completely nonverbal until two and a half years old, diagnosed with autism when I was four, and today as an adult, after years of supports and therapies, have been able to hold down five jobs as a professional speaker, best-selling author, film consultant, local TV talk show host, and nonprofit founder that mentors and gives out scholarships for students with autism and disabilities to go to college. I now give talks to companies about disabilities in the workforce to educate about the unique abilities individuals with disabilities can have if given the opportunity. I see a future where my high school mentees, who all have autism and are extremely bright and gifted, can transition to adulthood and succeed in the workforce. Some of them may have challenges at first, but so does everyone. With the accommodations in place, you may very well be surprised by what you see from each and every single one of them. To conclude, U.S. Secretary of Labor Alexander Acosta has said, Americans of all abilities must have access to good, safe jobs. Smart employers know that, including different perspectives in problem-solving situations leads to better solutions. Hiring employees with diverse abilities strengthens their business, increases competition, and drives innovation. Dr. Tumble Grandin reminds us to see the person, not the label. Together, let's focus on making inclusion celebrated, not only in the workplace, but in every place around the world. So this uh, initiative truly started a few years after uh, we started uh, speaking. Uh, most of the talks we gave uh, early on were talking to employers about the power of uh, effective communication to really spearhead your organizations, both from an uh, internal perspective and also an external perspective. Uh, so now today we've kind of molded that into presentations going into not only giving lunch and learn type of events, but also going into human resource departments and giving consultations about topics such as the interview process for those with disabilities. Now, just by a show of hands really quickly, who in here has met someone in the past who maybe they didn't necessarily think deserved a job, but had a really, really good interview at the time? Anyway, yeah, it's happened, it's happened. Now, many individuals I know with disabilities, especially individuals who have communication difficulties, social difficulties, don't necessarily see the, int the interview process as fair, because a lot of the times these people think concretely. They think that, literally these questions have to be as concrete as humanly possible. So we actually go into many organizations and ask about foregoing the interview process for a one day job trial where potential employees can just truly show what they're capable of, especially in the fields of STEM. So for many individuals with disabilities have really been able to maximize science, technology, engineering, and mathematic jobs where it's more focused on one-on-one -on -one job responsibilities versus an actual group uh, process. So uh, providing job descriptions, we also go into companies and talk about what, whenever they're putting out a job application, whether it's on monster.com, LinkedIn, et cetera, and so forth, that they try to be as concrete as possible and not fake in nature. I mean, we've all had the application once or twice where it says you have to have good interpersonal skills, and we're like, okay, what does that mean? Uh, so uh, it's important to be as concrete as humanly possible. And then also talking about reasonable accommodations and the accommodations that are available for individuals with disabilities in the workplace today. 
but also showing 503 uh, compliance. So reasonable accommodations today. Uh, we believe disclosure is so, so important. We truly believe through the philosophy of just, as I mentioned to Theo, Dr. Temple Grandin, who is an amazing, amazing autism advocate. One of her biggest quotes is, uh, see, see the able, not the label. And uh, we, we truly believe that disclosure is so important for these kids who are growing and uh, getting jobs today to be able to actually uh, succeed in the workforce. So it's against the law to ask someone if they have a disability uh, and providing awareness events, not only during October, which is National Disability Employment Awareness Month, but also embracing diversity all year round truly, truly helps connectivity amongst uh, actual workers in the workplace. And human resources should try to be acknowledging more and more to not only individuals with disabilities, but non-disabled individuals who work at companies about uh, individuals with disabilities and some of the signs that they may have. Uh, reasonable accommodations go further, uh, taking on a bigger role with more individuals later in life developing physical disabilities. Now, not only individuals who are getting diagnosed with disabilities at a very early age, but as people get older, developing physical disabilities is very, very common. Uh, so more awareness is needed, focus on the lifespan of disabilities, not only for individuals who are young, but also individuals as uh, they are going into later adulthood. So my journey with autism and employment, now I was told by I was told by countless people when I was in school that it would be very, very hard for me to get a job one day because I would think very, very literally. Sarcasm would go over my head. I wouldn't understand any single joke. And I didn't make my first friend until I was 14. So they thought my interpersonal skills would never give me the opportunity to really become someone who could succeed in the workforce. And uh, it was a lot of trial and error. It, my parents became my greatest advocates growing up, truly gave me through uh, situations where we would do mock interviews, where we would truly try to help assess and transition me to the workforce by giving me uh, schedules and trying to help me understand what the job environment looked like before I even went into that specific job. And I think that's something that could help anyone, truly. Uh, this gave us opportunity to give two TED Talks in uh, the past five years. The first talk uh, in my local community in New Jersey, The Will of Opportunity, The Path of Autism to College, which focuses on those with uh, individuals uh, who have autism uh, pursuing a post-secondary education, but then also finding interns uh, opportunities uh, in, in the workforce. And then the second one, uh, what happens to children with autism when they become adults, focuses on a question that hits a lot of families, especially parents, and that is what will happen to my child when I'm gone. Uh, in our community today, uh, especially in the autism community, over 500,000 individuals with autism will be reaching adulthood within the next decade untapped potential, untapped market of individuals who will be reaching adulthood, and many of these individuals will be highly skilled. I, some of the kids I know with autism are the most bright, brightest kids in the world, and uh, my friend Temple Grandin uh, once said that she believes that half of Silicon Valley is actually on the autism spectrum because they think literally they're able to do one-on-one -on -one projects so simply and um, they're some of the most brightest people you would ever meet. So that just goes into uh, another quote which I share a lot of the time. It's that when we're thinking about the how to get these individuals hired, it's best to think of it as this quote right here, which says, if you met one individual with a disability, you've truly met one individual with a disability, regardless if it's autism or not. Each, there's no one size fits all for a proper way of hiring someone with a disability. So it's truly important to create your own blueprint of what that looks like by simply getting to know and establishing a rapport with the individuals you work with. That can mean anything from having more social outings after work for people to get to know each other better, from peer mentoring programs for 
actual summits where individuals can have more opportunities to network with uh, each other. But also at the same time, one of the biggest things we, we talk about in a lot of companies is uh, the importance of self-reflection. And actually, uh, we encourage many employees, both with disabilities and not, to have journal entries, to continue to self-reflect on their strengths and weaknesses. Because especially in our disability community, one of my favorite quotes from Temple Grandin is, interests and talents can truly turn into careers. But for many individuals with disabilities, they may not necessarily think about their strengths a lot of the times because they're so focused on trying to overcome some of the weaknesses to find a job. So seven ways I truly found employment today. Uh, the number one was honing in on my key interests, uh, which I'll talk a little bit later in this presentation. Um, becoming a self-advocate. When I was going to college for the first time, uh, so in school, individuals with disabilities can get an IEP, which is an individual education plan. And when I was going to college, I uh, received no transitional services in high school, so I actually went up to my uh, post-secondary uh, disability support specialist, and I told her, uh, if you could just hook me up with my IEP, I'll be out of here and I'll be ready to go. And she said, child, sit down. And uh, told me for the first time about uh, reasonable accommodations. And I never, never knew about it. So I had to become a self-advocate uh, and I was very dear in headlights at the time. However, uh, I, I, I took it in stride. I took less credits to really understand the need to become a self-advocate. And having that impact at a very, very early age in college actually helped propel uh, me to finding jobs once I graduated uh, from college. Uh, asking questions is another big thing. I, I think, it, it, and it may seem cliche, but we still, as a community, sometimes don't ask those dumb questions because we think they're going to be dumb questions. And there is no such thing as a dumb question. Really make sure that you're focused on that. So uh, doing research on job careers is also very, very important. Uh, realizing I couldn't live by a label. Uh, Self-reflection exercises were critical. I've been writing in a journal since I was 12 years old about my strengths and weaknesses. Uh, when I found out I had autism at 11 and a half, we were playing a dis uh, celebrity disability bingo <laughs> in one of my social skills classes. And I was learning that people like Michael Jordan had ADD and Magic Johnson had ADHD. And I asked, why am I special uh, to my social skills teacher? And she's like, oh, you have to talk to your parents about that. And that was after school, that was the first time they told me I had autism. But after that, I started writing journal entries uh, based on just going into IEP meetings to learn about my strengths and weaknesses. And then finally, role playing different situations, such as mock interview processes, uh, truly helped me. So the two interests that helped me uh, growing up, first was theater. I wanted to be the sixth member of the Backstreet Boys growing up. Uh, for my 11th birthday, I wanted the uh, white suit from the I Want It That Way video. Uh, so I was clearly a dork, uh, still am a dork a little bit, uh, but I, I fell in love with music therapy. At a time when I was having difficulties with loud noises, bright lights, uh, there was always something soothing about being on stage even though the lights were there, but also something soothing about music. So I, I stuck to theater uh, for about 15 years. And once I uh, graduated from high school, I became an autism advocate and found one of my first jobs, which was to be an autism consultant on major motion pictures based on my focus on the entertainment industry. Getting to work on films such as Joyful Noise, which stars a teenager with autism in the film. Other films such as Jane Wants a Boyfriend, which focuses on a girl with autism trying to find love in New York City. And then also consulting on documentaries such as Big Daddy Autism, which looks at a single dad with a nonverbal child on the spectrum. And Don't Boil My Plants, which goes into the employment background actually focuses on employment for those uh, with disabilities. And then uh, basketball, I wanted to be the next Larry Bird. <laughs> so uh, I integrated basketball into my physical therapy. Growing up, I could tell you all 30 NBA teams and every single player on those teams simply because it was one of my key interests. And once I graduated from high school, I didn't get any division one offers, womp womp. Uh, but I got involved uh, with uh, NBA Cares, which is a nonprofit organization, getting to interview countless NBA celebrities to share the impact of sports 
uh, uh, the impact sports can have on individuals with disabilities and asking them to consider uh, getting involved with philanthropy that causes towards our special need community. So hiring people with autism and other disabilities truly just makes good business sense. Uh, customers with disabilities and their families, for those in this room who don't know, represent a trillion dollar market today in the United States. They, like other market segments, purchase products and services from companies that best meet their needs. And a large number of Americans today uh, say that they would prefer to patronize with businesses that hire people with disabilities. And then finally, businesses across the United States have begun to realize that hiring talented candidates with disabilities is not only the right thing to do, it makes good business sense while demonstrating high return on investment and aids in 503 compliance, which every organization has to do. Uh, so how to manage employees with disabilities? This is actually one of the biggest questions we usually get during the Q&A period. And one of the biggest things don't come in with any uh, unperceived notions. We say that sometimes we think in a box, and you have to think outside the box as well. Uh, Document challenges and strengths in the workplace. Please use concrete language as much as you possibly can. And take your time when you're talking to these individuals. And make sure that they know what you said. And if they ask you to repeat it, I mean, sometimes that's going to be what you have to do. Make sure all team building events are accessible. This is huge. I've seen so many convocations where events have happened with things such as no wheelchair accessibility and and it literally blows my mind to this day. Um, I would also uh, definitely look at a, a leadership book called The New One Minute Manager. It's a fantastic, fantastic book that really looks at how you can go about establishing a rapport with uh, your employees. And offer professional development training by bringing in experts and individuals with disabilities who have successfully navigated the workplace. These are some examples of success stories of corporations today who are currently hiring individuals with disabilities. One of the common themes you'll see in many of these companies is that they have a high focus on technology, the SAPs of the world, the Freddie Macs of the world. Uh, so there is a focus on those STEM jobs that are really helping these individuals. So finally, I uh, just want to share with you some quotes from some of my mentees on what disabilities uh, and, and trying to find employment means to them. So one individual, uh, Ron Sanderson, he's one of the first passers uh, to ever have autism. And he wanted people to know, employers, we with autism would love for you to understand that not all disabilities are visible. When we don't look you in the eye, it does not mean we aren't there. Uh, if we fail to shake your hand or we say something not appropriate, it does not mean we're trying to be rude. When we need extra clarification to do the job, it does not mean we are slow or stupid. Due to autism, we process information differently, but we also have amazing gifts like an attention to details and uh, faithful to attended work. And then, I love this guy, uh, Matthew, who's an aspiring accountant, he says, when working with people with autism, it's best not to focus on how they appear. I feel it's more important to focus on their work and the outcomes of that work. Even if they look uninterested and unfocused, they probably are interested and focused. They likely care more than they let on. And to quote the Transformer movie, which he absolutely loves, there's more than meets the eye for individuals with autism. So finally, what employers need to focus on today is clear job response responsibilities more than anything else. If you go to the Department of Labor's website, they have an amazing, amazing booklet called The Business Strategies That Work, a Framework for Disability Inclusion. The link is right here. I'd highly recommend for anyone who's looking to hire more individuals with disabilities in their workplace to give it a very thorough look. It's, it, it has some guidelines on everything we're talking today about job descriptions to how you can host diversity events in your workplace towards individuals with disabilities, and I've seen it help countless, countless companies today. So, you know, j just as a final thought, uh, I never thought that any of this was going to be possible. When I was growing up, people told me that it would be very, very unlikely that I would even get to college. And now the thing I could say is that even though it's a spectrum, 
uh, disability is a spectrum, and some kids are gonna be on the severe end who might need lifetime care. I can truly say today that we as a community in the United States are the most diverse in our history right now. And we need to think about ways we can think outside of the box towards maximizing the potential of all of our companies. And with that, I couldn't think of a better way than trying to maximize and utilize the potential of some of these amazing, amazing individuals with disabilities, as long as we just give them the chance to show what they're made of. Thank you all so much for having me today. And, and at this time, we left a few minutes left in the program for Q&A, so we'd be more than happy to answer any questions you have at this time. Thank you all so much for coming out. Yes. So <clears throat> I'm curious what specific reasonable accommodations tend to be most useful for employees with autism, and to what extent do they have success in getting them? So most of the time they do. Again, most uh, individuals uh, who, who file for reasonable accommodations, accommodations can be anything from uh, written explanations to specific tasks for uh, specific projects that they're supposed to do. Lots of people with autism think in many different ways. Some people think in pictures, some people think visually, some people think it auditory. So sometimes they will get things such as written explanations on all their projects. Sometimes they can ask for accommodation where they can get emails versus actually having to hear a like verbal project and kind of just like have a breakdown with uh, either their current boss or someone who's part of a human resource department. That's usually what we see the most, but then we also see um, accommodations uh, such as being able to bring a recorder for uh, some team meetings to actually be able to, um, a confidential recorder uh, to, to actually uh, be able to listen to the actual assignments that they're given and also to uh, provide it for feedback for them as well. So those are like the two biggest ones that are currently helping individuals in the workplace today that we recommend. Hope that helped. Yes. Uh, uh, the uh, notion of clear job responsibilities. Yes. Is, uh, <laughs> it's very interesting. We've, uh, well, thinking about uh, performance evaluation for some reason, as well as yeah. hiring. Um, mm -hmm. I found that uh, it's, it's difficult for companies to uh, phrase their job requirements in that concrete terms. So any hints on how we can do that better? So one of the biggest things is when uh, someone actually does apply for a job. So uh, it's, it, it is a process. And one of the biggest things I say, it's not a sprint. <laughs> Most of the time, it is very much a marathon when it comes to each uh, unique individual who may be applying for this job. One of the biggest things I would truly say is to really think about, uh, we, we try to think of this as an annual perspective. So we think about the job uh, projects that an individual might have for out the year. And we try to talk to companies about how we can kind of just like pinpoint some specific areas. So for example, uh, one of the things that we'll do is we'll, we'll talk to a human resource department about uh, if, for example, they're in the technology field and they have to do a certain amount of code or they have to do JavaScript and focus on a website, we, we kind of say, like, we need to have HTML in here. We need to have JavaScript in here. So we kind of try to make it not only concrete, but as descriptive as humanly possible. Many uh, job applications today are only one page, uh, which we see on a lot of sites like monster.com and LinkedIn. So we try to make sure that it's not only concrete, but it's also as descriptive as humanly possible because those are two different channels completely. So it's not only about being concrete, but it's also being making sure that you list out every single requirement that you're going to need for that person as well, especially if they're doing a very specific job that's already going to need proper training before they go into the job. Hi. Hi. Thanks for coming. Um, Glad to be I here. am an intern recruiter here, and I've worked with several candidates who have autism. Happy to say that many of them will be joining us this summer as oh, engineers, yay. which is awesome. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, so I have a question. I'm just curious if you, I know you mentioned, you know, companies obviously can't ask people if they have a disability. Yeah. Um, and I think you said that you advise. Um, 
students, candidates to self-disclose. Yes. I'm curious, you know, what your advice is like when you tell them that they should be self-disclosing if it's at the beginning of the process or what the timing of that is like. So one of the biggest things with individuals with disabilities we see is that if you don't disclose right away, it becomes very, very difficult once they actually get into the workforce to get those reasonable accommodations versus actually disclosing right ahead of time because usually there's a few weeks before an employee will actually start uh, the, the actual internship or position. So that gives the human resource department a possibility to talk to the specific boss of that employee about what some of the accommodations are gonna be. So if someone, for example, goes in two, three weeks and says, you know what, I need a reasonable accommodation, it doesn't, it kind of brings in a very tough transitional phase. And for many individuals with disabilities, along with autism that I know, have very uh, difficult times at times with transitions and being able to go through that, especially when you think of uh, many individuals to this day, I know adults love things like visual schedules and will have like these schedules in either a book that they bring around with them where they have everything set up um, they, they need to do it right away to avoid misunderstandings, miscommunication at a later time, especially uh, with transitions, but also with uh, the communication with their boss and their team. So that's, why, that's like the number one reason why we uh, encourage disclosure right away. Yeah, makes sense, thanks. Any other thoughts, questions? Yeah, yes. I'm gonna, I wanna specialize a little in the, on the uh, issue of, of um, of uh, reasonable accommodations. Um, one thing that I think tends to get short shrift um, is sensory accommodations. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so in your experience, what, what have you seen has worked for people on the autism spectrum in terms of, of specifically sensory uh, accommodations? Well, uh, I know sensory wise, so uh, actually in companies I would always um, and this has gradually like slowed down as I got a little older, but I've always uh, used a sensory brush, uh, which is like the size of my palm for uh, whenever I would have a situation. Now I know obviously uh, many reasonable accommodations in the workplace, they don't necessarily provide a sensory brush, uh, but uh, things for example, I, I've seen a lot of individuals with sensory issues uh, prefer to use uh, laptops for all their assignments versus any RIN projects, which is very accessible now because we're trying to go green in many companies today. Anyway, uh, so uh, utilizing uh, assistive technology laptops, uh, especially for uh, more sensory issues that are focused on kind of just holding things such as pencils and pens, there might be textural issues that individuals uh, might deal with, especially um, if, if, if they're provided in certain ways, like having to write on paper, having to write even on like a whiteboard or a, a smart board might be difficult for them. So being able to utilize uh, their assistive technology, whether it be an iPad or uh, being able to use a computer as well. So that's one of the bigger reasonable accommodations we see, especially on the, on the sensory realm. And it's gonna vary for person to, to person as well. So, hope that helps. Yes. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, so if individual doesn't self-disclose, is it uh, polite and advice to ask uh, if you think, okay, maybe uh, if I knew that, uh, w w what are the better ways to communicate, for example, uh, like whether uh, verbal communication or written communication is, uh, should be used? But what's the best, best way to approach it? Well, the thing we see the most is that when companies do decide to get involved with uh, professional training and, de and decide to get involved with uh, really trying to show diversity in their workplace, it becomes a more enlightening organization to have that aha moment where they're like, you know what, maybe we can disclose a disability versus a company where they don't necessarily see those specific accommodations. I've gone into many companies where uh, even being able to be wheelchair accessible and being able to have very visual signs of that has even actually come off to a domino effect for individuals with learning disabilities saying that they're doing so much for physical disabilities that could trickle down for those with learning 
declaring disabilities and, more, and are more likely to want to disclose. So it's not only the visuals that are around each and every specific company, but it's also hosting special events and professional training to focus on diversity and inclusion in the workplace. So my example is, uh, for example, I, I was working with an individual which appeared to uh, like not paying attention to w what we were like doing, right? And later I, I learned that uh, the individual was on autism spectrum and have I known that maybe I tried harder or like tried different ways of communicating. So is it something that's reasonable to ask? Uh, directly or not? No, uh, unfortunately not. It's uh, because you have to think about the individual in right. that case right. uh, and what their reaction might be if that is brought up. And that could lead to problems down the line with work effectiveness and the human resource okay. violation or difficulty down the line as well. So, um, yeah. All right, cool. <laughs> Thanks for coming in. Um, my hey, wife and I are actually in the process of adopting a child special needs, so this is true and dear to my heart. Um, it's awesome. I have a question. We we just kind of finished rounds of uh, performance reviews, and um, I'm curious to hear like what have um, you kind of consulted various different companies on how to provide effective feedback for those who have autism in knowing their condition and um, how to address and um, help them to grow. Sure. So uh, a perfect example. We so so the companies we've spoken to so far, and uh, the, the the bigger companies, we've gone to many small parent rent organizations, but we've been to the PNC, uh, American Express, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, PSENG, uh, Wyndham Worldwide. So we've even done like hotels and how to be uh, friend, friendlier to uh, hotel guests who might have uh, individuals with disabilities. So one of the biggest things we we kind of talk about in in, in that realm uh, about about trying to be having that communication and that feedback is to truly kind of assess short and long-term goals with all individuals, and this is not only for individuals with disabilities, but we should be doing more one-on-ones, whether it be on a weekly basis, a bi-weekly basis, and trying to assess, especially if it disclose, just how their kind of process is going in a specific job, and not necessarily focus on like, so Carrie, how are you doing as a person with autism at this job? Just being just one-on-one -on -one with them about if their accommodations, if they need more accommodations once they've actually disclosed that. I think that's one of the biggest, biggest things. We need more communication and open communication because a lot of these people also think literally they also don't necessarily understand things such as different tones of voice, different tones of language, and especially when it comes to body language and being able to understand facial expressions and facial cues as well. So the more literal, the better. And I heard that was my last question. I hope that helps. But I'll, I have business cards for every single person in this room. Uh, we, we expect to uh, have about 100. So I'm more than happy to ask any question after this presentation. And thank you all so much for having me. It was wonderful. Thank you, thank so, you so much. much. Thank you.